Chapter 3, Socialization, Fear, and Aggression Aggressive behavior in domestic dogs is an issue that has long needed to come out of the closet. There is incredible stigma attached to dogs that bite, as though they have character flaws or are qualitatively different from dogs who have never bitten. They are not. There are not two kinds of dogs, nice dogs who never bite and less nice dogs who do. Biting is a natural, normal dog behavior. This is why it is so prevalent. Biting and threat displays, which are simply the indication of intention to bite, are how dogs settle both minor and major disputes and defend themselves from any perceived threat when they cannot or ought not to flee. In dog culture, there are no letters to the editor, slanderous gossip and backstabbing, guilty feelings, democratic institutions, or lawyers. There are growls, snarls, snaps, and bites. Aggressive behavior does not fracture relationships in dog society. It's all taken very much in stride. The problem is that aggression often changes things a great deal in dog-human relationships. We routinely execute dogs who bite. That's quite the culture clash. There is an important distinction to be made between dogs who inflict egregious damage when they bite, breaking bones, mutilating flesh, putting people in the hospital, or killing them, and garden variety biters who inflict no damage or damage equivalent to a minor kitchen injury. In the wake of dramatic incidents of mauling and human fatalities that get massive media play, there is some understandable terror among the general population. It is terribly, terribly important to understand the rarity of these kinds of attacks. There are and have been for as far back as records have been kept between 12 and 20 dog-related fatalities per year in the U.S. Considering the degree of exposure, the number of dogs and people in close contact for extended durations every single day, this is a vanishingly tiny incidence. To get a grasp of exactly how tiny, get a hold of Janice Bradley's Dog's Bite, but balloons and slippers are more dangerous. Headline-grabbing dog attacks put the idea non-representatively into human minds. Usually no effort is made to distinguish dogs involved in fatal and near-fatal maulings from kitchen injury-level biters. In human terms, this would be like lumping sharp words with felony assault and murder. The lumping of kitchen injury biters with fatal maulers has sharpened the public quasi hormonata complex about dogs. If my dog is a nice dog who wouldn't kill someone, and dogs that are a bit growly or deliver minor bites are the same as killers, then there is a huge divide between my nice dog and your dog who is a bit growly. My dog isn't even capable. If we can get over this preliminary hurd hurdle in understanding what do we make of normal dogs, the vast majority. The domestication of dogs has made it easier to socialize them, but it has not provided any guarantee against antisocial behavior. Selective breeding practices dance with the devil all of the time by stating, in breed standards, temperament characteristics such as aloof, discerning, wary of strangers, one family dog, etc. The behavior these stated ideals flirt with, and too often consummate, is fear and aggression towards strangers. The mythical dog is one who can tell the good guys from the bad guys. Gentle with toddlers and accepting of family friends, the mythical dog instantly springs into action, attacking would-be robbers and muggers. For every anecdotal report of an otherwise allegedly perfectly friendly dog who nailed the burglar, there are scores, hundreds perhaps, thousands of dogs that, for identical reasons, nailed the neighbor, the delivery guy, or a child in the park. The mundane, unglamorous reason in the vast majority of cases of dogs biting people is the falling short of breeding and rearing practices of what is an absurd ideal in the first place, no bites ever. Breeding practices range from bitches' choice accidental from the human's perspective mating to a prodigious cranking of, out of dogs by well-meaning owners and hobbyists. They include backyard breeders lacking knowledge or even consideration of the genetics of behavior to fanciers who breed to a confirmation standard or who may even deliberately breed for low ease of socialization. One family dog, euphemism breeding. It's hard to know what to do with this last group, the fanciers. On one hand, many fine dogs are produced and many interesting breeds are maintained. On the other hand, animal shelters on this continent are forced to slaughter millions of dogs per year, most of which are healthy and friendly. All of other kinds of breeding have been indicted for their role in this insanity with the exception of the dog fancy. As far as the deliberate breeding of harder to socialize dogs, society may decide it's perfectly acceptable to deliberately breed dogs that are less easily made friendly to strangers. Indeed, that seems to be the current standard, if by default and not careful consideration. 
Alternatively, society may decide it wants multiple lines of defense against dog bites, and breeding practices will come under great scrutiny. The attitude among breeders of hard-to-socialize dogs seem to be one of the sidestepping any cultability by implement, implicating owner's failure to compensate with extensive socialization. I'm for strong socialization as much as anyone, but redundant lines of defense would be better. As laws currently stand, I could spend 20 or 30 generations combining genes to produce the most aggressive dog possible and sell the dog to pretty much anyone I want. A buyer of one of my dogs may then do all the right things vis-a-vis -vis socialization and training. Should that dog ever bite someone, however, the owner, or depending on which state one is in, whoever is holding the leash at the time, is liable, but I, the breeder, am not. This is like my being allowed to build a bomb in my basement, deliberately making it as dangerous a bomb as possible, and then sell it with no legal ramifications. I think it's partly because we live in a nurture-biased society where we seem determined to deny any genetic influence on behavior. This is lucidly discussed in Steven Pinker's The Blank State. This nurture bias is selective, however, as evidenced by such actions as breed ban legislation. Breed bans seem a doomed attempt to reduce dog bites. Not only are they both under-inclusive, failing to capture dangerous dogs not in the banned breed, and over-inclusive, capturing perfectly friendly dogs in the banned breed. They miss the entire supply and demand root of the problem. Even if a breed ban could be successfully enforced, it would take anyone wanting aggressive dogs not very many generations to corrupt another breed, and this assumes that the problem is entirely genetic. Gene Team Passes the Baton as Dr. Ian Dunbar said, once the gene team has had its turn, rearing practices are all that's left to manipulate. In other words, there's no crying over spilled milk. An individual dog very well may have unhelpful genetics, but there's nothing that can be done about it with current technology. The, fo the focus, one sperm meets egg, must be on environment. Two additional considerations worth noting at this juncture are prenatal environment and maternal behavior. There is some research that suggests stress during pregnancy, at least in rodents, can potentiate stress over responsiveness in adult offspring. This is also some suggestion that maternal behavior alone in dogs can influence the development of fear in puppies. Although neither of these are under control of dog owners, pressure could be brought to bear on breeders via consumer education, the prospective purchaser of their puppies. Once the baton is passed to the dog's owners, the socialization effort is often retarded by the extreme hand-in-the-sand attitude regarding the potential for garden variety aggression. Most owners have never actually done any active aggression prevention training. Most would agree with the statement, my dog would bite only with extreme provocation. What's insidious is that almost all owners of dogs who bite seemingly without provocation believe their own dog to be safe the day before or the minute before the dog bit for the first time. Because of this normalcy, of the behavior and the spotty track record by the gene team to breed super friendly dogs, all dogs must be acknowledged as potential biters. Dogs are unaware that they've been adopted into a culture where biting is considered a betrayal of trust and a capital offense. Incredibly little is actively, consciously done to reduce the, pro the probability of biting. Flight bite is the dog's hardwired program for increasing their distance from another that spooks them. Dogs, like most animals, are extremely aware of and constantly manipulating social distance. There are only two ways to do this, move yourself away or get the other guy to move away. Plan A or Plan B. Getting the other guy to move away is the function of aggression. Which plan an individual dog chooses first, threaten or run, is a function of his genetic predisposition and learning history. Dogs will do what tends to have been successful in the past. They will also, if plan A is not working, switch without hesitation to plan B. Corner dog switch to threat display. Dogs spooked by your presence into behaving aggressively will turn and run if aggression doesn't work. It is a matter of great urgency when the increased distance alarm goes off in a dog's head. Genetic predisposition simply makes one plan or the other more likely and influences how likely the dog is to spook in the first place. All other things, such as how we, well socialized he is, begin being equal. An important piece of the puzzle that is missing in mass education is information about the seemingly innocuous event and context that most often elicit spooking in domestic dogs. To accept aggression as normal behavior would require a fundamental shift in our view of domestic dogs. The potential playoff 
is that we could, starting today, reduce the number and severity of dog bites by facing up to pro the problems. Dogs are animals and animals bite. It would simply take a large-scale initiation of routine prevention intervention to minimize risk. The real epidemic. Whenever there is a headline making dog attack in which someone is seriously injured, public officials are pressured to do something about the epidemic. The reason these incidents make the news, as opposed to, say, a kid getting a comparable injury in a car accident or falling out of a tree, is that it is an inc incredibly rare event. As I mentioned earlier, there is no epidemic of extremely serious dog bites. There is, however, an epidemic of people being growled at, snarled at, and bitten to the tune of spit only, or a small puncture wound or two. When a dog bites at the level of kitchen injury, he is stigmatized and often killed. The mythology of dogs in general goes relatively unhurt because the individual bitter is blamed and labeled deviant, often lumped in as a potential killer even by some less rational dog professionals. From a normal dog's perspective, however, allowing a decrease in social distance between himself and anyone to whom he's not habituated or socialized would more likely qualify as deviant behavior. So why aren't dogs dog bites as daily occurrence? For one thing, kitchen injury bites are. Statistics in Western countries where the number of bites is recorded are invariably mind-boggling, and these are the reported bites. A much larger number go unreported. Many other dogs simply never meet up with a particular combination of elements that would cause them to bite, but this is a stroke of luck. There is no qualitative difference or even necessarily a quantitative difference between their temperament and that of the repeat biter next door. Just as it's inherently clear to dogs that a good proportion of matter is chew toys, it's equally obvious that you should tr threaten to bite or bite anyone who is spooky and comes too close or who's tries to obtain important resources in your possession. The mental hurdle people seem to have is accepting that the dog decides what is spooky or threatening. This is a dangerous place to be anthropomorphic. We humans had better start to pay attention to what these things are or we will be left with the tired refrain of, I don't understand it, suddenly and without warning and with no provocation, blah, blah, blah. So a major element of the culture clash between dogs and humans is deferring perceptions of what constitutes a threat. The most commonly uttered phrase following a bite is that the dog bit unprovoked or suddenly for no reason. This is because the number one bite provocation is domestic dogs is some variation on a behavior we humans consider unprovocative or even friendly. We are mired in the belief that the friendly intention behind this gesture is read and understood by all dogs. We've been reinforced in this belief by the dogs who tolerate patting and handling. For sure, some dogs actively enjoy and solicitate patting from people. Many dogs, however, just tolerate or actively dislike it or dislike it from people they don't know. And for a dog who is not socialized to say men, the mere presence of a man is provocative. What's important to understand is that bites are rarely cases of abuse or trauma, but failures of omission. Not enough was done to get the dog prepared for life in a human environment. Desensitizing dogs to approach and handling must be actively installed to proof them against spooking. Dogs who bite people or are afraid of people are usually behaving like normal animals. To understand why dogs bite for reasons indiscernible to most owners, it is first necessary to understand socialization. Socialization, what is it anyway? Socialization means habituation or getting used to environmental elements through exposure to them. In a natural setting, it is a highly adaptive to increase distance between yourself and anything unusual and then to proceed with extreme caution when approaching. This is because unusual things are potentially very bad news. They certainly aren't necessary for survival because you've made it this far without them. Animals adhere to rules governing social distance. So do we, if you think about it. We tolerate someone standing right next, right against us in a crowded elevator, but would be instantly spooked by the same person standing that close if we were the only two in the elevator. Someone can walk up and stand right behind you if you're in line at a grocery store, but someone doing exactly the same thing when you're in the driveway washing your car is a whole other story. We can also, like other animals, be very weird about being touched. An animal's curiosity is antagonistic to fear and usually less pronounced. While it is potentially adaptive to explore novel things in case they yield some advantage, especially in the case of predators, 
excessive curiosity would eventually result in exposure to danger and hence reproductive disadvantage. In other words, the cost of a false positive, spooking away from something that is in fact harmless or beneficial, is greatly outweighed by the cost of a false negative, failing to spook away from something that is dangerous. You can't pass on these curious genes if you're dead or injured. Consider, for instance, what you'd think about any wild animal in the forest that didn't flee from you or didn't put on an aggressive display if you concerned it. Would you think he was a nice animal or would you think he was, say, sick? Avoidance of novelty is the default setting for animals. All these truths about animals are pretty self-evident and list we forgot dogs are animals. Because it would not be adaptive for animals to be continuously spooking at rocks and trees and bird songs, a mechanism is wired in to ensure the animal habituates to normal environmental features. This is the socialization period, a finite time when young animals are much less fearful and are much more likely to approach and investigate novel things, and they readily form social bonds. Adult animals can habituate to novel things too. It simply takes much longer the socialization window cannot remain open forever. If it did, then you couldn't have animals trotting up to you in the forest. Every species of animal has acquired, through natural selection, an average time to assimilate and accept things in their environment. After this period, they will behave to increased distance through fight-slash-flight mechanisms from anything to which they have not been socialized. There is also a use-it-or-lose-it clause some animals will become increasingly fearful of things they may have encountered in the critical period, but see too seldom thereafter. Notice that the pressure is always in the direction of increasing fearfulness and avoidance, never the other way. Artificial pressure needs to be constantly exerted to get animals to behave tolerantly. It must be actively bred for and or dis installed in the socialization period and maintained thereafter. As soon as there is any weakness in the system, the animal starts leaning towards fight slash flight. By definition, the socialization period, be it on one day or several months, is what works well for the species in the environment in which it evolved. In the case of domestic dogs, the socialization window closes somewhere between three and five months of age. Depending on the breed and individual makeup, with easy habituation drying up about by around four and a half months of age in the majority of cases. These thresholds are ma a matter of consensus, by the way, not strong empirical research. Many of us would really, really like to know what's going on regarding critical socialization periods in dogs and any relevant details regarding breed differences. The trend among hardcore dog people is toward earlier and earlier formal socialization, i.e. puppy classes for puppies in the 7 to 11 week old range. There is increasingly willingness to balance the socialization imperative with the need for pathogen avoidance in young puppies with inadequate immunity. The importance of a critical period for socialization is hard to overestimate. If, for instance, a puppy doesn't get sufficient exposure to men with beards before the socialization clock runs out, the risk for fear responses and aggression directed at men with beards runs higher for that dog as an adult. It's particularly wrinkly because dogs are expert discriminators. Adequate socialization to women or 8-year-old kids, for example, does not guarantee a generalization to men or 2-year-old kids. Therefore, it's advisable to go way overboard covering all these bases before the socialization window closes, especially for spooky, spookier breeds or individuals. This means exposing the puppy to as wide a social sphere as possible in terms of human age groups, sexes, sizes, shapes, colors, and gates. The experiences should be positive, play, treats, nothing scary, and include a wide variety of padding, handling, and movement by the humans. It also means getting the puppy used to anything it may have to encounter in later life, such as car rides, veterinarian exams, make the first one or two fun rather than scary, cats, traffic, soccer games, elevators, and pointy sticks. Pumped up socialization. I think there are dual benefits to he heavy socialization. One is obvious. The more you socialize the puppy, the fewer things you'll miss. The second advantage is a more global effect. The more the puppy encounters novel situations in which it initially is reluctant or spooky and then gets it over and habituates, as puppies do so well, the more the underlying trait of stability or bounce back is developed. The puppy's overall confidence grows. The more puppyhood experiences a dog has to draw on, the more resilient the character. The mild stresses of regular novelty in early life are like inoculations. So provided the puppy had really 
thorough socialization and developed good bounce back individual elements that were missed during socialization will be handled more easily by the adult animal. The passive approach, get the puppy out to a few shopping malls and dog shows, is inadequate for some individuals. Aim for a systematic, continual assault style program. Not only do you end up with a dog who is at reduced risk for fearfulness and biting, but one who is also under more, much less chronic stress as an adult. The puppy that has had positive experiences is less likely as an adult to spook in a challenging situation than the dog who had only neutral experiences. So why not improve your odds by getting a relaxed, confident, solid adult temperament by actively increasing the number of strongly positive experiences? This is like putting money in the bank. Also, note, if the puppy has a negative experience on the first trial of exposure to something, a full-blown phobia can be acquired. Why go for a dog who's more or less habituated to screaming toddlers or teenagers on rollerblades when you can end up with one who's actively likes them? In socialization to any category of people, the single best way to obtain this cushion is through hand feeding. Rather than simply getting the puppy around young children, have young children hand feed the puppy small, tasty treats. Each treat builds up a little more money in the bank for young children. Another method... suitably for predatory types who are addicted to games with toys or balls is to have people in the category you're trying to cover engage in favorite games with the puppy socialization hit list adult woman meets in corridor hand fed adult men visits house hand fed teenagers sees on street hand fed eight to twelve year olds patted by in the park hand fed four to seven years old sees in schoolyard hand fed Toddlers, visits house, hand fed, assisted by adult. Babies, see on street, fed when sniffs. Beards, sees at a distance, hand fed near. Hats and sunglasses, sees on pedestrians, wear while playing with dog. Odd gait slash dancing, might see by chance, hand fed at salsa class. All races, sees occasionally, hand fed by. Crowds, attends outdoor event, hand fed at the event. Uniforms, puppy meets mailman, hand-fed near. Wheelchairs, sniffs one, hand-fed near. Crutches, sees at train station, hand-fed near. Bikes, sees on street, hand-fed near. Inline skates, sees on street, hand-fed near. Traffic, walks near, walks by to fun place. Car rides, around block to fun places. Cat slash livestock, sees and sniffs, treats from... Owner after sniffs, dogs, meets and greets, off-leash play. The list is not exhaustive. You cannot overdo socialization. The payoff is enormous. I have often taught that owners who are inclined to leave their dog socialization to everyday life, i.e. chance, should meet families of garden variety biters or dogs with world-class phobias of innocuous environmental elements. They would hear a lot of, if only, many of these dogs appeared fine as puppies. They reacted well to what they were exposed to, but it wasn't enough, either in volume or range. Experiences were neutral, rarely positive. They saw people, but not up close. They saw women, but rarely men. They saw plenty of people who were never manhandled. There was an omission. Doing remedial socialization on an adult dog is a slow, labor-intensive undertaking. If it is doable at all, It is infinitely easier to work on puppies because of that open window of the socialization period. If you have a puppy, bite the bullet and socialize it now. It's criminal to not put massive effort into a dog like Kvass, who was already know, who we already know is hardwired to be spookier. Remember, smoke screens like reserved with strangers or takes a while to warm up to people or great with the family or protective mean one thing and one thing only, uncomfortable around strangers, period. There is no longer any excuse for dogs to reach adulthood emotionally crippled and at risk for execution after they bite someone because of insufficient socialization. The information has been out there for years. Dog bites continue to be common despite all of the information on how to prevent them. Perhaps there's a late feedback effect. The punishing results of failing to adequately socialize a dog appears too late to modify owner's behavior. Heavy socialization is the single smartest investment you can make in a dog. Socialization case history. The Campbell family consists of mom, dad, and three kids, aged 17, 15, 11. They recently put to sleep their 10-year-old German Shepherd due to illness. Their other Shepherd, aged 7, 
has always lived with another dog, so the Campbells bought a new shepherd puppy a few months after the death of their older dog. The puppy, Bruce, was bright and naturally very compliant, got along well with other dogs, and fitted in, fit into the family easily. It was much easier raising this puppy than previous puppies because the family was better off financially than years earlier, had a house in the suburbs with a fenced-in yard for the dog to play in, and the kids were older and able to take more responsibility for feeding, training, and cleanup. The family was shocked and appalled when Bruce, at age eight months, bit a visiting four-year-old girl when she tried to pat the dog. This story is so common it makes me want to scream. The owners are experienced German Shepherd owners. Their first two dogs never bit anyone, never threatened anyone. One was reserved around strangers, simply retreated when they approached, and never in his life felt concerned enough to switch to Plan B, biting. The Campbells bought from the same breeder and are at a loss to explain Bruce's biting because they raised him the same way. What they don't realize is they got away with no active socialization with the first two dogs for a number of reasons. They were raised in a household with young children who had friends over constantly, which covered that base. At the time, the family lived in an apartment, so the dogs had regular walks, which exposed them to slight sights and sounds in a busy city. And their shepherd, who avoided strangers, was simply a time bomb that never went off. Time bomb dogs. Bruce experienced the same passive socialization, but with a couple of differences. The kids were older when he was a puppy, so the occasional kids he saw felt to him like aliens from Mars. The yard offered exercise and elimination, which was more convenient than taking him out on a leash, so he missed out on the regular walks. No walks equals no meeting people. The other difference is that his response when spooked was a threat display rather than flight like their previous shepherd, even though his motives were the same as the other dog, to increase distance between himself and the child who tried to touch him. It's important to understand that this is not a case of the Campbells doing a good job on the first two dogs and then failing on the third dog, or of the breeder producing a lemon. They never actively socialized any of their dogs, but got away with it with the first two. Their time shepherd would likely have resorted to threat if flight had been unavailable when encountering strangers, plan B. It just never happened. These owners never considered what they were doing to be insufficient until inevitably one of their time bombs went off. Many people raise time bomb dogs who, because of some combination of passive socialization, absence of sufficient challenge, and that individual dog's reaction style, flight being plan A, don't explode and bite during their lifetimes, so generations of dog owners continue to gamble unknowingly. Heavy socialization, although it does not provide a guarantee against biting, vastly improves your odds. Socialization can be upgraded from neutral to positive experiences and from passive to active. It's far better to actively seek out those categories of people and things than to hope that enough basis will be covered by whatever experience happened to come up in the puppy's day-to-day -day life. This is especially important for puppies who are at a greater risk. These are puppies of certain breeds, any puppy observed to already be reserved, timid, reactive, or sensitive puppies from litters, not whelped, and raised in a human-infested home, i.e. litters, whelped in kennels, barns, etc. Puppies belonging to owners who live in rural, rural or quiet suburban areas, puppies whose owners have yards, puppies of small breeds with overprotective owners, puppies raised in multi-dog households, including dog exhibitors, and puppies of larger, scary-looking breeds with strangers may avoid. The breed at risk are an interesting mix. Herding dogs are, I think rightly, often put forward as dogs that need package warnings for their high drive and higher risk of shyness with strangers. I would speculate here about the absence of selection pressure of gregariousness in dogs whose work and lives are, by definition, in a rural environment, and the high pressure on working ability and style in the early foundation stock. Where herding dogs come by their shyness by happenstance, the U.S. versus them breeds come by it more by design. One collection of U.S. versus them breeds is the flock guardian dogs, notoriously hard to socialize, which is understandable when one considers their original tasks, living with a flock of sheep and noticing and driving off predators. The other lot is the guard dogs that guard people and other sorts of property besides livestock. They are not only less comfortable around strangers, but more sensitive to environmental changes, such as people with odd gaits, people appearing suddenly, moving unexpectedly, and presenting other odd pictures. There is a case to be made, for example, for mandating rehearsal of strangers. 
doing odd, sudden stuff around Great Dane and giant schnauzer puppies, among others. Puppy classes. A marvelous in- innovation has been the introduction of quality puppy kindergarten classes. Although puppy classes have been offered in the past, these were barely distinguishable from traditional jerk and praise obedience classes and often did more harm than good, especially in the case of puppies. This may be part of the reason behind the old ad- admonition by veterinarians and other dog resources people to not begin formal training until a dog is at least six months old. The puppies couldn't withstand the training. Pioneering puppy trainers like Dr. Ian Dunbar turned it all around with gentle, amazingly effective puppy-friendly methods that teach compliance while performance aggression, prophylax, and improving sociability all at the same time. There is little limit to what young puppies are capable of learning if the method is right. It's a tragic lost opportunity to delay taking a dog to class till he's an adolescent. Puppy classes are the way of the future. Another benefit of puppy classes is the instant provision of age mates for the developing pup. The problem of basic dog-to-dog socialization is very often obliterated simply by showing up to class. This assumes that the class in question is a true puppy class limited to vaccinated puppies under the age of 18 weeks, rather than a beginner-level obedience course masquerading as a puppy class. All training in a good puppy class should use positive reinforcement as motivation rather than some form of other training collar. There should also be frequent puppy play sessions. Aside from the dog-to-dog social repertoire development, play is one form for the acquisition of bite inhibition. Bite inhibition. Dogs are animals equipped to kill, tear apart carcasses, and crack bone with their jaws. They are also highly social and, as animal species go, argumentative. If they are to live among others with this kind of weaponry as standard issues, they need some means of preventing serious injury to each other during altercations. This is the function of ritualization. Ritualization is a series of conventions that evolve in an animal species to allow the resolution of conflict with reduced risk to all participants. This is because, in a natural environment, flat-out aggression is expensive behavior. Injury risks to winner as well as loser, energy expenditures, time away from other pursuits, and if you're a prey species, reduce vigilance and increased conspicuousness as to predators are the costs. To mitigate these costs, animals ritualize agonistics, conflict resolution, encounters. In the case of normal dogs, postures, sn- stares, growls, snarls, snaps, and reduced forces bites all stand in or flat out attacking. The cornerstone of ritualized aggression is bite inhibition. Dogs are not born with soft mouths, but they are wired up to easily acquire the ability to bite softly if conditions are right. The right conditions means plenty of feedback about bite strength during the first few months of life. To ensure that puppies get plenty of feedback about bite strength, nature has made puppies into variability biting machines with needle-like teeth. Normal puppies can and should play bite continually in social interactions. Of high concern is the fact that puppies are removed from their litters early in life and often placed in a relatively social vacuum. This is greatly compounded if the puppy is forbidden from play biting his owners. Suppressing puppy biting too early means the puppy doesn't get the repeated doses of feedback on his jaw strength. The puppy grows up with a hard mouth. Ironically, this is a serious squandering of a critical line of defense against dog bites. Smart puppy owners allow some puppy biting in order to give the puppy information on his own strength. Puppy biting is such a valuable thing, in fact, that puppies who do not play bite should be actively encouraged to do so in order to rehearse soft mouth. Start off by targeting harder bites. Let the puppy chomp away on your hand and monitor the level of pressure. Although puppy teeth are sharp, puppy jaws are undeveloped, so this will not be unbearable. As soon as the puppy bears down a little harder screech, ouch! As though it hurt much more than it did, look at the puppy like he's a little axe murderer and leave the room for a minute or two. This time, this time out is a clear refusal to play consequence with the ouch as the conditioned punisher. Many puppies also have an innate understanding of the screech, making the system work even better. After the minute or two has passed, return and resume play. He may be more prudent temporarily and he may not. Be prepared to repeat this procedure over and over to the trend emerges. Puppy learns that if puppy bites too hard, puppy plays by himself. 
is beneficial from a generalization standpoint if more than one person implements these same rules. The exception is young children. Young kids and puppies are an extremely dangerous combination. Kids do all of the wrong things around dogs. They scream, flap, move a lot, fall down, and react in a fun for the puppy way when the puppy bites them. They expertly stimulate wounded animals and bring out the predatory rehearsal repertoire in the dog all too well. They are not good candidates to install soft mouths in acceptable puppies. Young kids should be around puppies and well-socialized adult dogs for that matter, only when actively supervised by an adult. All their interactions should be carefully referred. When the puppy starts to rev up, the kids must exist exit to the adults may do the soft mouth exercises or redirect the puppy's energy. Kids should never, ever, ever be allowed to go up to a strange dog. The kids and dogs as wonderful playmates is an overblown and highly dangerous myth. Two lines of defense is the way to go. One, socialize puppies to kids. And two, supervise all interactions between dogs and kids. When the puppy has a consistently demonstrated some greater self-control, you may start targeting, targeting even lower pressure bites. The reason for the reason for doing it in stages is to get in plenty of soft biting practices. Plus, the puppy would be unable to comply if you set too high an initial criteria. He's got to be able to, to manage the task you set for him. Little biting maniac puppies can and do learn to hold back on their hard bites, but they are simply unable to hold back on most bites too early on, unless you obliterate the puppy with harsh punishments. You're teaching him self-control in manageable chunks. When he is mouthing you with very little pressure, you may then teach him don't touch and redirect him to appropriate biteable objects like his toys. He now knows that he may not bite humans at all and you've got the critically important fringe benefit of acquired bite inhibition. Good puppy classes do a splendid job on these don't touch exercises. I very much like the idea of maintaining bite inhibition in grown up dogs. The best way to do this is to hand feed the dog do mouth exams and teeth brushing, and engage in structured roughhousing. You'll be doing a lot of hand feeding anyway if you use food reinforcement in training. Rather than letting the dog eat out of your flat hand, hold food morsels in your fingers. If you feel incisors on your fingers, screech ouch and without the food, and withhold the food. Only relinquish food regardless of the brilliance of the behavior you are reinforcing if the dog is demonstrably prudent with his jaws and you feel no pressure on your fingers. Dogs need these constant reminders so they don't get rusty. Another good way to get your hands into a dog's mouth is to regularly brush their teeth. This is a good idea anyway, and super palatable dog toothpaste exists now. Regular dental maintenance like this gives you opportunities to remind the dog to be gentle with his mouth as well as giving the dog nice breath and tartar-free teeth. Yet another opportunity to fine-tune bite inhibition is during tug and fetch games. Without exception, screech in pain and end the game if the dog makes a grabbing error and nicks or bites you instead of the toy. Play in roughhousing with dogs and with people. Young dogs that are socialized with usually spar and jaw wrestle with other dogs endlessly if given the chance. One function of play is thought to be rehearsal of, rehearsal of the four Fs, fighting, fleeing, feeding, and courtship. In the case of play biting, the fighting and feeding, i.e. hunting, Skills are getting a workout. This behavioral is normal, healthy, and adaptive, with the important benefit of minimizing the chances of a regular player ever developing a hard mouth, keeping the social skills well-oiled, and constantly reassociating the close proximity of other dogs with extreme pleasure. Owners of dogs usually identify dog play as a problem for one of three reasons. One, Normal play is extremely rough and intense and therefore frightening for some owners to witness, so they want to curb it in case the dog becomes aggressive. 2. The owner can't compete with the attractiveness of other dogs as a playmate and the dog has obedience problems in the presence of other dogs. 3. The play is directed at humans. The logic behind number 1 is back to front. Dogs who do not regularly play with other dogs usually have the poorest social skills. They have a difficult time both delivering and reading dog body language. These naive animals come in two varieties. One kind is tense, asocial, and proximity sensitive. They may pre present as shy and snappy if dogs come too close. This can evolve into preemptive lunging and aggression as they learn that display works to keep other dogs away and then cut to the chase when a dog approaches. 
The other variety is hyper-motivated and keen, but still with extremely coarse skills. They are often described by their owners as too excited. When they meet dogs, they engage in annoying gross play solicitations and rude investigations, all of which evoke defensiveness in other dogs. Regular play builds confidence, improves the dog's repertoire of interspecific com- communications, and maintains the dog's soft mouth. The more dog dogs he is interacted with, the more slick his social skills grow to be. Culminating in a dog who is a veritable doggy diplomat, able to coax even worried or asocial dogs into play, appease tough guys, and diffuse potential fights with mind-boggling, subtle body language. At the other end of the spectrum is the two-sided coin of fear and aggression. Dogs who are basically unsocialized to other species. This is pretty much a travesty, considering the genetic predisposition predisposition dogs have to become socialized to and form bonds with any living thing they have sufficient contact with before four months of age. Owners of socially inept animals often say things like, he's dominant with other dogs, and I can't bring him around other dogs, he gets too excited. What they didn't realize is that they will never make the dog place by restricting his access. There is no question that most well-socialized dogs will be extremely attracted to and enjoy playing with other dogs. As a result, obedience that is near perfect when there is no competing motivation may fall apart in the presence of other dogs. It is important not to go overboard in labeling failure to comply as insubordination when obedience behaviors conflict with enjoyable things like dog play. The dog is always perfectly obedient to the contingencies in the environment. If the dog does not come when called or otherwise be obedient when there are other dogs around, it is because... 1. Coming when called has never been necessary to obtain access to dogs. 2. Coming when called has proven to be mutually exclusive to dog access. It actually ends the fun, so has been punished while other strategies have been differentially reinforced. 3. Other reinforcers employed by the owner are below dog access to the reinforcer hierarchy. 4. The owner has sufficient leverage, but the behavior is not well enough generalized. Dogs doesn't red come in that context. Strange but true that dogs are susceptible to this. This is the most useful way of looking at the problem of competing motivation. I'll get into more detail about training in the presence of competing motivation in the final chapter. The point is that limiting dog play or failing to socialize a dog in order to avoid its distraction is shooting yourself in the foot. You... You still don't know how to train against competing motivation, and now you have an under-socialized, under-exercised, under-stimulated dog. You're in the flames. The third dog play problem is an example of the culture clash. Normal dog play directed as humans is both annoying and potentially dangerous. It is essential that the dog be quickly brought up to speed regarding the social norms in a human environment. The rules the dog must assimilate regarding his play behavior Vis-a-vis humans are, one, mouth of human flesh and clothing at all times, exception when invited to roughhouse. Two, when people run and ride bikes, don't chase them. Three, paws off at all times. Understand that our having these jaw paws rules means that the dog must never engage in the pre-programmed play behavior with people. If you look at dog-to-dog play, there is none of it that we humans would like directed at us in day-to-day life. It's important to inform the dog about this and to provide alternative outlets in the form of regular access to other dogs and interactive games with humans that we can live with, often involving toys as an intermediary. Some people opt to roughhouse with their dog. I am an example. The game is always human initiated and the dogs are taught to stop on cue. Overly rough mouthing or failure to stop on cue results in abrupt cessation of the game. Roughhousing with the dogs generates controversy in the traditional dog training crowd who makes a Pandora's box argument that, in my opinion, just doesn't fly. In fact, the case of the one common trigger of aggression, body handling, wrestling, and roughhousing with the dog could be beneficial insofar as it increases the dog's familiarity and comfort with hands in a wide variety of touch on a wide variety of body parts. The other two benefits of roughhousing are rehearsal of bite inhibition and terrific outlet for dog energy. To maintain bite inhibition, monitor the pressure of the mouthing, during roughhousing and say ouch, then abruptly cease the game if the dog is anything less than perfectly gentle with its jaws. Game misconduct penalties can also be used to control the starting and stopping of the game. If the dog starts before being invited or fails to stop when asked, note the similarity between these rules and those for tug. Timid puppies. 
What we most like to see is a puppy who is outgoing, who readily and confidently with a wagging tail approaches any person and who play bites feverishly. This is a puppy who actively seeks to close distance with novel humans and is diametrically opposed to flight or bite puppies who work to increase social distance. Note that the continuum of temperament is not one with fear and aggression at opposite ends of the spectrum and normal in the middle. Rather, at one extreme, there is relaxed, confident, highly affiliated behavior, and at the other end is the two-headed coin of fear and aggression. Fear and aggression are considered flip sides of the lack of confidence coin because they are really just strategies to accomplish the same end, to keep the scary stimulus far enough away. Dogs readily switch strategy if their usual style doesn't work. So, the opposite of a fearful dog is a relaxed, confident dog, and the opposite of an aggressive dog is, you guessed it, a relaxed, confident dog. This is why lack of confidence in a puppy is such a major emergency. If we don't see outgoingness in a puppy, the race begins to see how much we can install before the socialization period comes to an end. Timid puppies often come around at an astounding rate with intense socialization becoming different dogs in a matter of days. To achieve a comparable change in an adult dog usually takes weeks or months for formal desensitization and counterconditioning. In fact, if a timid puppy does not make dramatic gains, it is a sign that formal effort, like likely extending well into adulthood, will be necessary. One of the debates in the fear literature is whether severe deficits can be reversed with diligent effort. You'll hear biases in applied dog behavior circles ranging from recommendations to write off fearful puppies without fast curves of improvement to convictions that all or most can be improved with time and care. This area could use some good research. Regardless of your personal bias, puppies who present with shyness around strangers urgently need intervention. Whatever the puppy seems afraid of or growls at should be the target of a massive effort to get the puppy comfortable and confident. The goal is a puppy who willingly chooses to approach and make contact. The best results I've seen have been obtained with long-duration passive socialization in conjunction with counter-conditioning where the puppy can set his own pace. This means the handler must find whatever medication or zen-like mood is necessary to make him abstain from ever forcing the puppy to socialize, as is many people's inclination. Dog trainers, ironically, can be micromanagers and, however, well, this serves them in other training endeavors, is must be suspended for work with fearful dogs or puppies. It's critically important when working with timid puppies or dogs that it be pup- the puppy's choice whether to approach and at what speed. If the puppy wants to keep his distance for a few minutes or half an hour, that must be respected. Rushing the puppy or forcing him to make contact with people or things that frighten him can exasperate the existing fear. The puppy thought someone was a bit dangerous. Now you've proven him right by associating the strong fear response brought about by coerced contact and the person or thing you're trying to make him seem benign. Not a good move. Much better to keep the scary person or thing stationary and let the puppy approach at his own pace. Step out of the but it's just a posture. It's the puppy's call whether he's afraid, not yours, about whether he should be or not. This is why a passive approach works so well. Arrange a therapeutic situation and then give it time to unfold. Imagine yourself strapped to a chair and someone coming at you with a blowtorch. If they said, they're there, it's okay, it's okay, would it feel okay? The only thing that would make it okay would be for you to have a freedom of movement to access the blowtorch in your own way, at your own pace. And if someone kept putting cash right near it, you might, with great prudence, sneak in and collect the cash and gradually get more comfortable. You might even end up doing some welding. Desensitizing timid puppies is no different. Puppy's choice must be respected. Every time the puppy of his own accord takes the risk to approach something scary and lives through it, or better still, has a positive experience, the puppy's confidence gets a boost. Adding tasty bait to the process is enormously helpful. For instance, a strange man remains motionless but has a sliced hot dog sprinkled all over him while he reads a magazine. Each time the puppy finally feels confident enough to approach, the approach is reinforced with a hot dog slice. The probability of future approaches starts to go up. You're off and running. Escalations to moving people, approaching people, people who patent demographic variations can gradually be added with puppy's choice, always respected. The approach is called passive training because once you've set up the scary person or object and the sprinkled bait, your presence of intervention is no longer necessary. Go about your business while the puppy self-trains. 
Passive training is extremely valuable for socializing, socializing timid animals because the time frames involved in more active training fall out of the limits of most people's patience. This is a slow process. Do not give up or switch to something counterproductive, such as the pressuring of the puppy. When working with shrinking violets, this is a double, doubly important when working with adult dogs. Puppy temperament testing. An extremely popular topic in the doggy crowd is puppy testing. Numerous formal tests purport to objectively measure fixed traits such as dominance, predatory drive, fearfulness, and sociability. Unfortunately, some serious doubt has been cast upon both the reliability and predictive validity of puppy temperament tests. One fly in the ointment is that the presumed immutability of temperament has proven iffy, if not false. The temperament of dog, right down to such seemingly basic traits as level of dominance, and more importantly, how outgoing the puppy is, is surprisingly plastic. There is no compelling data yet correlating results from the existing puppy temperament test with measurable adult behavior. Temperament re- test results on any given puppy also vary widely from one day to the next and from one tester to the next. Contact latency tests, how long till the puppy goes right up to a person when it enters the room, are one such example. People who are slow or non-approachers can be turned into keen approachers in a couple of reinforced trials, so how real is the underlying trait with the, which the test purports to measure? Most of these tests fail to get at the underlying trait they are supposed to. For instance, a litter of six puppies will be individually tested at their reaction to a novel stimulus like an umbrella suddenly opening. Let's say puppies one and two are not spooked in the slightest. They wag and investigate the umbrella. Puppies three and four spook right or spook first and then investigate. Puppies five and six spook but don't come around so to investigating by the end of the testing period. What we have learned about the temperaments of these puppies. The standard test interpretation would read that puppies one and two are very stable. Puppies three and four are a bit spooky and puppies five and six are definitely spooky. They, the reality is that we haven't learned anything about puppies one and two. Puppies three and four have demonstrated reactivity but excellent bounce back and puppies five and six have demonstrated reactivity and some lack of bounce back. Puppies 1 and 2 haven't been tested yet. Remember, the test is to determine the reaction of a dog to something that frightens it, not the puppy's attitude about wet weather gear. Before it's possible to see how well numbers 1 and 2 respond to a fearful stimulus, you first have to supply one. All that can be concluded from the test is that pups 1 and 2 aren't afraid of umbrellas. We still don't know how they will react when they encounter something that scares them. They may react as did 3 and 4, or they may be like 5 and 6 or worse. The jury is still out. Even more interesting is that both the reactivity and bounce back of all these puppies could likely be modified through through early experience. Take numbers five and six, do some exercises and retest them. Owners of dogs like one and two are conceivably also at risk because their puppies seem solid as a rock because they tend to be non-reactive. Non-reactive puppies or puppies who are very selectively reactive don't get as much of an opportunity to develop bounce back and do not have a much attention paid to their socialization because they don't seem to need it. This is a big mistake. Remember, the dual benefit of socialization. It's not just to reduce the number of items in the universe at which the puppy might spook, but to repeatedly provide the experience of first feeling fearful and then getting over it. Bounce back is one of the most valuable traits you can still instill in a dog. Flaky or brittle temperaments are those that are unforging, unforgiving or acquire phobias more easily. The chances of a dog turning out this way are reduced if bounce back is developed early regardless of whether the dog in question was highly reactive, spooks fairly easy, or non-reactive, spooks less often. Dog-to-dog socialization. Dog-to-dog socialization is, if you think about it, a laughable problem. How far would dogs have gotten as species if they routinely, routinely mutilated each other? An awful lot is wired into dogs to prevent this if we only provide an adequate crucible for the interspecific social repertoire to develop. This is a big if only because many owners make such a mess of it. I have devoted an entire manual to -to dog-to-dog aggression problems, so we deliver only an overview only here. Dogs seem pretty compulsive about making contact with one another so that they can engage in the important ritual of mutual 
rear sniffing. They really want to know who the other dog is, familiar or unfamiliar, sex, reproductive status, etc. Greet, investigate in some detail, and posture or initiate play. None of this can be established at a distance. Many owners find the urgency with which dogs pull and leash towards other dogs or otherwise act up, i.e. are motivated and animated. Worrisome or irritating. They punish the behavior or prohibit contact with other dog. This leaves the dog with a corked up backlog of social craving, which ends up actually contributing to unpolished social behavior when contact ever is made with another dog. The socially starved and inexperienced dog comes on too strong and the owner's prophecy is fulfilled, so future contact with dogs is avoided. Perpetuating the cycle. Bottom line, social skills develop with repeated exposure and deteriorate with isolation. Things get even worse when the other dog is similarly handled so that now two juiced up socially naive animals are involved. Also, the owners often exasperate dog-to-dog tension by choking up on the leash to hold the already frustrated dog just out of reach. Dogs in general behave much more aggressively on leash than off. This is due to a couple of effects. The first is barrier frustration. Barrier frustration also contributes to the aggression and displaying observed in kenneled dogs, dogs who are tied out and dogs who fence fight. Dogs in these circumstances repeatedly see things they are highly motivated to approach and investigate but are prevented from doing so. If this happens repeatedly, the dog develops a Pavlovian Pavlovian response of frustration at the sight of dogs. And if the dog has had traditional obedience training, other dogs may also become associated with increased probability of leash corrections. Many have also suggested that tie-outs and fences provide too well-defined a territory, and this effect is responsible for the huge increase in aggression in these dogs. I don't personally buy this as a primary cause. Dogs who are timid or aggressive with people or dogs usually need remedial socialization, not fuzzier territorial lines. A well-socialized dog will watch dog bark and then go through all the normal motions. He will excitedly sniff and greet the newcomer, hopefully offering appeasement behaviors. An under-socialized dog will watch dog bark and then stay back, growling, make tracks to somewhere else in the house and hide, or oscillate between approaching and avoiding, probably barking the whole time. We do know the fence fighters are best treated by introducing them off-leash without barriers, providing the dog in question have acquired bite inhibition. Owners typically expect a bloodbath given at the long history of the blustering at each other through the fence, but these dogs almost always fizzle out some after some minor ritualizing, jostling, or scuffling. Many become playmates. Needless to say, the ideal is for the dog to experience as little barrier frustration as possible in the first place. This can be accomplished by not tying dogs out or leaving them intermittently in yards. In addition, you should allow regular contact and play between dogs who live in the opposite sides of the fence. Another flavor of on-leash dog problem occurs when dogs who have cho- ha- who would choose to increase distance or approach indirectly are prevented from doing so by the leash. If the dog is motivated to flee, it is thwarted plan B, aggressive display, may pop out and then be reinforced by withdrawal of the other dog, often as a function of the other owner sensibly backing off. Or if the dog would have made a more n- nonced, indirect approach and this is thwarted, he may be made anxious by being forced to approach directly. This in turn could bring out the worst in the other dog, kicking off a various cycle. An accumulation of these experiences result in a dog who learns that on-leash dog meeting situations predict stress. The owner contributes by being generally edgy and pos- possibly putative. The descript The discriminative stimulus is the sight of another dog on the street. All this stress and punishment becomes a dog has caught sight of another member of his species. What these proximity-sensitive dogs need is well-executed desensitization and counter-conditioning to other dogs to build up their confidence to remove the motivation of aggression. My favorite modus operandus is to start with a classical approach, straight DNC, and then develop a competing response. It goes like this. First, teach the dog that other dogs predict a gooey, jolly, treat-reigning handler, regardless of response. Then once the lunge rate falls, my rule of thumb is down to 50%, switch to training a behavior that is mutually exclusive to lunging, such as sit and watch, i.e. no longer regardless of response. Now the treat depends on the sit and watch compliance. By the time the lunge rate is down to 50%, many dogs will already have a fledgling 
its superstitious orient to handler response that grew out of UCS anticipation. The dog orients to the expected source of treats. This makes for a seamless transition from classical to operant conditioning. The other type of naive dog, the unrefined, super motivated ones, do well with off-leash experiences in small groups of well-socialized adult dogs, i.e. dogs who have regular contact with a variety of other dogs. They will not tolerate much crude behavior, but they will also do no harm when dissuading the puppy or euthanistic, under-socialized adolescent. The, tra- the tragedy is that naive dogs are usually kept away from other dogs by their owners who find their gross behavior resulting scuffles too scary. Valuable social lessons are thus never learned and the dog never improves. This is the vicious cycle described above. The solution is to bite the bullet and let the goofy teenager take his lumps from established, well-socialized dogs, adults. It's fascinating to watch experienced dogs interact. Blaze, subtle, cool, virtually phoning in their greeting, posturing, play, solicitations, and appeasement. The limiting factor for such remedial socialization are the dog's bite inhibition and the availability of therapist dogs that can be recruited. The goal is for these dogs to make their first doggy friend. Therapist dogs are bulletproof, which means extremely well socialized, slick, friendly adults who have good bounce back. They are dog park types with scores of novel social contacts under their belts. They will be able to withstand the idiotic behavior of the fighter and stand a good chance of slowly seducing him into a playmate if given adequate opportunity. Get the dogs together off leash in a barren boring environment and watch from the sidelines. You can praise or reinforce neutral to positive interactions or stay passive, depending on what seems to be helpful the most. If the dog has a history of damaging other dogs and his bite inhibition is poor, remedial socialization is only an option if the dog is muzzled. With these kids, I'd put most energy into the development of better on-leash handability so that the dog can be walked. One interesting innovation is the advent of growling dog classes, which are designed to help rehab dog-aggressive dogs. The sophistication of these classes has increased astronomically since I first attempted them in the late 1980s. The San Francisco SPCA and St. Hubert's Animal Welfare Center in New Jersey both have exemplary exemplary curricula. In the case of inner male aggression, neutering is often extremely helpful, not so much to turn off the dog's hormonal brain bath, but to make him smell less threatening to other males, thus helping to sort circuit the positive feedback loop two males often get into. Food bowl exercises. Aside from socialization, there are other high priority exercises for puppies. These are food bowl exercises, object exchanges, placement cues, and body handling exercises. Left to themselves, a significant proportion of dogs will become resource, food, objective, objects, locations, and or owner garters, and be difficult to manipulate even routinely. This is because they are, no- they are normal animals, not because some particular individual stubborn, touchy, or vicious prophylactic exercises are therefore important for all puppies. When you feed your puppy, hang around while he eats, sit on the floor beside him, patting him and dangling her- your hands in their bowl. He needs to find out through repeated experience that your presence around his food and dish is not a threat. Feed him some meals in small installments to pound in the repeated association between your hand approaching the dish and good news. Another helping. Practice taking the bowl away in mid-meal and sprucing it up by adding something tastier. This can be a spoonful of canned food, cottage cheese, a piece of freeze-dried liver, or anything tasty or comfortable giving. Also, practice walking up to your dog while he's eating and dropping some nice morsel in. The goal is that your approach or removal of the bowl reliably predicts something good for the dog. This is to counteract his natural inclination to guard his food. In a natural environment, zealous garden for scarce resources like food would be highly adaptive and thus selective for. It crops up all too frequently in domestic dogs in spite of hundreds of generations of artificial selection and an abundant kibble supply. When opportunity presents itself, have other people add a bonus to the puppy's dish to better generalize the conditioning. Dr. Ian Dunbar conceptualized resource guarding many years ago as a lack of confidence. I think it is most usefully viewed from this angle as it points to prevention and treatment interventions that actually work. Think of the dog as insecure and paranoid, operating under an assumption that someone approaching his soggy rawhide or bowl full of kibble is a major life or death deal. Your goal is to teach him that it's not a big deal at all. In fact, it's good news. 
If you are working with a dog who has an existing problem rather than doing prevention on a puppy or non-guarding adult, you must proceed more slowly and carefully. A prerequisite to working on a known garter is that the dog has a soft mouth. To my knowledge, no one has had successful installing a soft mouth in a hard-mouthed adult dog or duress situations. If the dog takes treats roughly or mouths too hard, this can be softened up, but a bite delivered in an agonistic complex resolution or defensive context will be an intensity that seems to be established in young puppyhood. Depending on how damaging the bites of a harder mouth dog are, alternative strategies are necessary. Muzzling and or tethering during early treatment, lifetime management, or in the worst case, putting the dog to sleep. To avoid bleak prognosis, the single most important intervention is to help dogs develop good acquired bite inhibition while they are puppies. Here is a standard basic hierarchy for a food guarding dog. For more hierarchy design details, see mine, a guide to resource guarding in dogs. 1. Approach empty bowl and dog, put a small handful of food in, retreat, retreat, wait until dog finishes, and then approach with the next handful. Feed meals this way until the dog is clearly happy to have you approaching. 2. Approach empty bowl and dog, remove bowl, put handful of food in it, put bowl back down. Treat, wait until dog finishes, and then approach with the next handful. Feed meals this way until the dog is clearly happy to have you approach and remove bowl. Three, repeat exercises one and two, but now with overlap. Approach and add next handful before dog has finished previous installments. Four, sit next to dog and bowl with one hand on bowl. Stroking and talking to dog while a dog eats normal ration. Occasionally adding a tasty bonus to bowl with other hand. 5. Sit next to bowl while dog eating kibble. Remove hand from bowl to get a tasty bonus and then add it to the bowl. 6. Approach dog and bowl while dog eating. Add bonus to bowl. Retreat and repeat two or three times. 7. Approach dog and bowl while dog eating. Remove bowl. Add bonus. Replace bowl. Retreat and repeat two or three times. 8. Add bonus once per meal at random time. 9. Repeat steps with all family members. If at a given step the dog demonstrates any guarding, including growling, stiffness, freezing up, back off to an easier exercise and proceed more gradually to the problem exercise. If the dog, for instance, is fine on exercises 1 through 5, but growls if you approach while he is eating his normal meal, exercise 6, insert the following steps. 5a. Approach to a certain distance, say 3 feet, while the dog is eating and lob the bonus at the dish, retreat and repeat, gradually closing the distance until you are able to touch the bowl. 5b. Wait until he's only just finished and is licking the bowl before approaching with dessert. Each meal approached a second or two sooner until you are adding the bonus during the meal. The dog may also fall apart during overlap or at exercise 5 where you take your hand off the bowl during a meal. From the dog's perspective, this is very different from the previous exercise where you kept one hand on the bowl at all times. That was sharing. By taking your hand off, you are relinquishing possession. You may need to gradually fade your hand off the bowl if the dog starts guarding, then you try exercise 5. Do whatever it takes to get successful trials so you can prove to the dog that you are not a threat and that he can relax. If you can really get stumped at any point, lack confidence with this sort of thing, or if your dog is an explosive garter or dangerous biter, get yourself into the hands of a qualified trainer or behaviorist. Objective Changes Objective garters typically guard bones, valued chew toys, and forbidden objects such as bones, plastic wrap, Kleenexes, stolen laundry items, and garbage on the ground. With some of these dogs, there is a compulsive, reflexive quality to their guarding. Others seem triggered not just by the fact that they think the hamburger wrapper is so valuable, but by the fact that you are treating it as though it is an extremely valuable artifact by demonstrating such heated interest in taking it away. This, I realize, is a catch-22 for the owner. Either ignore the dog and allow him to pick up and even ingest all manner of junk he finds on the ground, or else increase the value of the item by showing great interest and taking it away from him. The best solution for all object guarders lies in priming and rehearsing the problem scenarios in advance. The dog needs to have done exchange exercises in preparation for the big day when he gets something truly dangerous, which you have to remove from his mouth pronto. If if he's relaxed and confident, he'll relinquish. If he's tense and insecure, he won't. You are one step ahead of the game if you start practicing on your puppy, and just like socialization, the younger you start, the better. The basic objective exchange exercise goes like this. 1. Give the dog an object. In early training, this will be an object he is unlikely to guard. Later, you will progress to hot objects. 2. Say, give or thank you. 3. Take the object away. 4. Give a nice treat from your pocket. Don't show it up front. 
Five, give the object back and repeat. Do five or so sets, varying the time between repetitions, and then walk away. Try to do a few sets of five repetitions a day, varying the object each time so the trend emerges. When humans take things away, it is a very good thing for dogs. BGTD. When some history of a successful exchange is in place, several days worth of a few sets per day, you may also start to practice taking away chew toys the dog has spontaneously taken possession of. Do a set of five and then let him carry on chewing. Always be aware of the value of the item you are taking away. For hot, highly valued by the dog, objects increase accordingly the value of the surprise treat he gets in exchange. You may reserve special treats like a morsel of leftover turkey or a chunk of old cheddar cheese for exchanges with the trickiest objects. These rare reinforcers really make an impression. Here's a typical hierarchy. 1. Set up exchanges with objects of no interest. Several set of five a day for two days. 2. Set up exchanges with slightly more coveted objects, several sets of five a day for two days. 3. Set up exchanges with hot objects using extra special treats, several sets of five a day for two or three days. 4. Exchanges with the low to mid-value objects the dog has spontaneously taken possession of. Do several in a row, then leave dog with it unless it is a forbidden object. Then give an extra special reinforcer on the last trial and replace object with a chew toy. 5. Exchange with hot objects the dog spontaneously has taken possession of. Do several in a row for extra special reinforcers, then return object to dog or replace it with interesting chew toy. 6. Maintenance. Occasional cold trials when dog has an object, one reinforced repetition, then give toy back or replace forbidden object with chew toy. It's okay to do the exchanges or removals without being armed with a treat in later training and maintenance. Head to the fridge or cover for the treat after the success. The dog can now tolerate the lag. Proceed to the next exercise in the hierarchy only when the dog is good at the exercise you are currently working on, meaning he is demonstrating happy anticipation before you have supplied the treat. For the duration of working this hierarchy, it is helpful if the dog is not given access to objects that are above the level you are training. This sets you both up for a guaranteed failure. For example, if the dog is on exercise 4, keep hot objects out of reach until you are ready to start exercise 5. You can't run until you can walk. For exercise 5, you may have to deliberately leave around a hot object so the dog will spontaneously take it possession. It is much better to have rehearsed in advance the tissue of plastic wrap guarding drama than to have it sprung on you when you aren't ready. Sufficient repetition of object exchanges exercises result in a dog who is actually eager for you to take stuff away from him. Aside from the behavior being reinforced by the food, the dog is getting a key bit of information. When humans take things away, they very often give them back. It is therefore no big deal. This is pretty unheard of in dog culture. When the dog is relaxed about exchanges, be sure to test the system with the occasional cold trial. Walk up to the dog while he's chewing, take his toy away, pop him a surprise reinforcer, and then let him carry on. Like any behavior, relaxed relinquishing may drift if it's not maintained. Make spot check cold trials at a regular game. In dogs with existing guarding problems, proceed more slowly on hire or hire a professional trainer who can plan and help you implement a hierarchy that's designed for your dog. Under no circumstances should children be given primary responsibility for this. If there are kids in the house, they will need to be practicing practice with the dog, but if and only if, one, the dog likes the kid, two, the dog has a known soft mouth, three, all adult members of the household have successfully completed the entire hierarchy already, four, the exercises done by the kids are supervised by an adult every second. This holds for all desensitization exercises, food bowl, location guarding, and handleability, not just object guarding. Be aware that if your dog is an object guarder and you modify it with these exercises but they don't have kids at home, your dog is still at some risk to guard against kids. Dogs don't generalize every every generalize very well. In fact, even if your dog has never guarded against you, there's a chance he will guard against strangers, especially kids, particularly if he is not be- beautifully socialized to kids. An extremely cunning move in the object guarding war is to teach your dog to retrieve. Aside from being an efficient exercise and predatory energy burner, using guarded objects as retrieve toys is a potent counter conditioning monkey wrench you can throw into the object guarding machinery. Simply playing with the dog with hot items can be an enormous tension reducer for both dog and handler. Play your hand very carefully the first few times you try this. The dog should first of all have an enthusiastic, well-conditioned retrieve of non-guarded items. 
The first time you try using a guarded object in Retrieve Games, whatever you do, stay glued to your chair so you don't slip into the usual rut of chasing the dog and demonstrating hot interest in the item itself. Play it very casual and hard to get, just as you would for the dog's usual retrieval toy. Use safe items so you can relax and train. Encourage the dog to come up with the reinforcement, reinforceable retrieves. Set criteria extremely low at first. Be prepared, for instance, to click and reinforce evidence of turning towards you. Break from chewing or any setback in your direction once he's got hold of the object. Celebrate each step with enthusiastic cheering and extra, extra nice food reinforcers. Then gradually crank up the standard as he gets better. It is perfectly reasonable to expect the sufficient practice. You're previously rabid object garter to happily fetch and drop in your lap items that you used to be hot. That's confidence. Placement cues. The classic location garter is a dog who jumps on the bed and then won't let you in, or a dog who, who stakes out the sofa and growls or snaps when you order him off or asks him to move over. The antidote is to teach what are called placement cues. You condition the dog with positive reinforcement to move his body to or from wherever you indicate. A certain percentage of dogs will, one day, actively location guard, so start practicing before there's a problem. It's also handy to be able to easily move the dog around without a lot of pushing and pulling. Typically, placement cues include into the crate, off the bed, into the car, off the sofa, out of the kitchen, onto the grooming table, etc. You simply make it another training exercise, a game. First, give the cue and then prompt the behavior. Any kind of coaching goes including food lures if you bog down. When the dog performs smoothly, you fade the prompt as you would for any obedience exercise. For example, practice off the sofa as follows. First, ask the dog onto the sofa. You need some fluency at getting him on that you have plenty of opportunities to practice getting him off. After you say onto the sofa, pat the cushion and make encouraging sounds. Come on, come on, plus enticing kissy sounds is a nice prompt. When the dog jumps on, praise him and mess mess up his hair a bit. Clever boy, plus pat, 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 ruffle. Reserve the heavier artillery of food reinforcement for getting him off. Now cue him off and start prompting him down. Off the sofa, pat the floor, snap fingers, clap hands, make kissy noises to move him off. If he moves off, give him a click and a treat and order him back up for an encore. You also may want to order him on and tell him to lie down to better stimulate the eventual real life scenario. If he doesn't move off, crank up the prompt a bit. Try backing away from the sofa. Make the best lovey-dovey sound you can. As a last resort, you will manufacture the reinforceable response with a food lure. If you had to go to a food lure to get him off, do this a couple more times and then put the food into your pocket during the prompting step for a remainder of the session. Always supply one for correct responses, but fade it as a lure ASAP. Do a couple of sessions, then practice cold trials. Cold trials are once-only repetitions of an exercise, preferably sprung on the dog when he is not expecting it, to test responses to cues in real life. If you will get the best mileage out of cold trials if you vary the reinforcer. This is quite a natural thing to do because a lot of the most potent reinforcers are not easily reusable within formal training sessions. A good example of this is walks. Unlike food reinforcement in tug retrieve games, which can be repeated again and again within a training session, the potent reinforcing event is the initiation of the taking a dog for a walk ritual. Because this happens at most a few times scattered throughout the day, try to exploit its value as a reinforcer by proceeding it with an off-the-couch placement. It is the perfect cold trial reinforcer. Wait until the dog is dug in on the couch before doing your cold trial. The sequence is 1. Off the couch. Q. 2. Dog complies. 3. Click and want to go for a walk. And four, initiate walk. Once again, do your utmost to not bribe him off by using the promised walk as a prompt. Say, want to go for a walk after he vacates the couch and then take the walk. This is World's way of offering the walk while he is still dug in, having not complied with the placement cue. The offering of the walk is a conditioned reinforcer, bridging to the walk, the primary reinforcer for this complying with the off the couch cue. So, to reiterate, once the dog is primed up in an initial training session with cue prompt response reinforcement trials and then cue response reinforcement trials with the recyclable reinforcers, i.e. food, don't you use lures of any kind. He must keep his part of the bargain on faith before you keep yours. Your eventual goal may be a variable schedule of reinforcement. He won't always be getting a walk after his compliance. 
He may have to gamble that on this occasion he only gets his hair messed up. If the dog guards location, such as the sofa or bed, against one specific person, that person must do some of the placement cue work. If it is a child or someone who lacks confidence around the dog, make sure that the dog has a soft mouth and supervise the session. If the problem is really severe, especially if there are kids in the picture, engage a competent behaviorist or trainer. I would also stress again the enormous value of doing placement cues exercises with puppies before a problem develops. Each on and off the bed sequences in and out of the car and in and out of the crate. Dogs who are raised to be happily compliant are at reduced risk for aggression directed at family members. Handleability. Dogs have to be handled for a multitude of reasons, including veterinary exams, being groomed, held down for otherwise physically restrained, and being hugged, grabbed, and patted by a wide variety of people. Good relaxed tolerance of handling does not come naturally for most dogs. One of the best favors you can do to your dog is to teach him, while he's still a malleable little puppy, to happy accept happily accept all the handling he will have to put up during this lifetime. You, your friends, family, and puppy classmates can all stimulate the main handling situations and pair them with food and play reinforcements. Start with grooming and basic physical exams. A good first exercise is to lay out all the grooming toys, brush, comb, toothbrush, toothpaste, nail clippers, scissors, and any other equipment. Let the dog come over and investigate these items, and as he does, click the clicker and give him an above-average reinforcer to make a good first impression. Then, practice holding the dog still and, with your hands, examine all his body parts, giving a small treat after each part. Look in one ear, treat. Look in the other ear, treat. Run fingers over the gums, treat. Practice gently opening the mouth and putting a treat on his tongue. Then put in a finger followed by a treat. If he tolerates this, depress the tongue a little more firmly each time before giving the treat. If he struggles, back off and do something less intrusive. Keep the treats coming str- coming furiously so that his participation is voluntary. When he does not comply, simply say, too bad, and withhold reinforcement. Feel his windpipe. Treat. Go b- down each leg between the toes and apply pressure to each nail. Treat. After each nail. Many dogs dislike having their feet handled, often the result of having nail clipped forced on them rather than being allowed to gradually tolerate and enjoy grooming by early association with goodies. Palpate the dog's belly and feel all the way down the tail. Each time you do a doctor session, do a little more examining for each treat. The final routine consists of an entire once over for one treat or play reinforcement. Dogs can learn to love being handled and restrained. Play doctor with the dog often and also practice grooming. Early on in your dog's grooming career, the ratio of reinforcers to produce two procedures will be high. One brush stroke, one treat. Then two brush stroke, one treat. Then four, then one deeper, firmer brush stroke, one treat. Then two, and so on. You will have, in a few short sessions, a dog who can brush deeply from head to toe for one small treat at the end. When the dog is comfortable about having his feet and nails touched in the veterinary exam simulation, start touching his nails with a nail clipper. One touch, one treat. Do this until he is very relaxed. Then do two more touches for one treat. Then hold the toe in one hand while you pretend to cut his nail with the nail clippers in the other hand. At this point, the nail clippers are not making contact with his nails, just with the air, but he is experiencing the restraint and sound of the clippers. Give one treat per nail until he is quite relaxed. If you own a high-energy dog, you may want to practice this initially when the dog is already in a relaxed mood. When the dog happily lets you air clip all his nails for one treat, try a real clip. Take off very little so you don't risk hitting the quick, which is very sensitive. The dog is not to get the nail clipped, but to set the dog up for a lifetime of easy nail clipping, so be patient. One tiny clip, one big treat. At the end of the session, have a short play period. In the early days... It's a good idea to have grooming sessions be a reliable predictor of things high up on the dog's reinforcer hierarchy, like predatory game sessions, walks, training games, or meals, along with the treats given throughout the session. If at any point in grooming or veterinary exam training sessions, the dog is reluctant or skittish, slow down and desensitize the anxiety-producing procedure more carefully. Dogs are often anxious about people looking in their ears, handling their feet and mouths, and pulling their coats, as when mats are removed. Invest time making the puppy comfortable about all these procedures. It's well worth it. When the puppy is highly groomable and easily examined, we call this wet spaghetti types because they are so relaxed and pliable. 
Other things to practice are grabbing the dog and patting, hugging and looming over him in scary ways. When a game make a game of these. Start off with slow, gentle grabs. One grab followed by one treat, then grab faster, then faster and rougher, culminating in emergency grabs and wrestling holds, treating after each successful trial. Do things to the dog that you would expect a two-year-old child to do. Grab an ear and pull. Give a treat. Grab the tail and pull. Give a treat. Particularly challenging are skin grabs. Do plenty escalating their severity gradually with a high density of food reinforcement. Pat the dog the way children do. Pat, pat, pat. Loom over the dog like a monster and then give him a treat. Pretend he has a broken leg. Lift him into the car. Your imagination is the limit. What might people do to your dog in his lifetime? When the dog is relaxed and enjoying every minute of these games, recruit strangers and kids to do them under your close supervision. Let the kids give better goodies than you normally give the dog so they can make a favorable impression. If your dog will be regularly handled by a groomer, it's worthwhile to visit the groomer a couple of times before the dog has to stay to be groomed. Bring him in, put him on the table, and have the groomer feed him a bunch of treats or take a few minutes to play tug or fetch with the dog in the grooming room. Practice in and out of the cage placements. Let the dog explore a bit, then go home. You can make similar visits to your veterinarian to make a strong, positive first impression. Needless to say, it's a good idea to find veterinarians and groomers who are gentle and willing to take a little time to hand feed your puppy. And last but not least, find a good puppy class and enroll. If you have an existing problem with handleability, you will do the same exercises, focus on the particular problem, but you will, one, proceed more slowly and gradually, two, temporarily avoid the problem situation in day-to-day life at levels the dog hasn't yet achieved in training sessions, three, get yourself into the hands of a qualified trainer or behaviorist if the problem is severe or you feel like you're floundered in. Rehab of aggressive dogs. Aggression is like any other behavior. It can be elicited and it morphs with learning. Examples of likely aggression elicitors are initiation or expectation of something painful, proximity of something the dog is afraid of, approach when the dog is in possession of some resource, body handling the dog is not habituated to, and any rapidly retreating object. This last trigger where the dog chases and or bites a squirrel ball or squealing child, you now know it's food acquisition behavior that, although topographically resembling aggression in that it involves biting living beings, is a whole other kettle of fish than the topic of this chapter. Dogs that are motivated to make others back off when they are afraid or uncomfortable or when they are guarding some resource. It's useful to divide our thinking about aggression into two domains. One, question about ultimate causation, the evolutionary significance of the behavior, i.e., why do dogs do that? And two, detailed information about immediate triggers, i.e., the who, what, where, how, far facts about the eliciting stimulus. Sometimes information from the first category will inform technique choice and execution, but more often than not, the second category, trigger details, will have the greatest influence on the nuts and bolts of behavior modification. The first domain, that of the evolutionary significance of behavior, is useful insofar as it helps people understand dogs and so hopefully better tolerate and enjoy expressions of their doggy nature. One of the fascinations of having dogs in their life of in the life is the daily cornucopia of foreign species repertoire. Empathy and expectation adjustments, however, shouldn't be confused with behavior modification techniques. I have some healthy skepticisms of explanation of aggression that make authoritative statements about what dogs are thinking when they threaten or bite. It's barely a cut above pet psychic stuff to make unfalsifiable proclamations, but this Quasithology is epidemic in the profession. Many existing models and classifications of aggression have turned out to be overly complicated labeling systems, seemingly based on we're not so sure how to fix this, so let's spend a long time labeling and talking about it. For example, if a dog growls and snaps when the owner leads him by the collar or restrains his head, you can spin yarns on your heart your heart's content about the dog's thoughts on the matter, including his thoughts about your thoughts about his rank your rank, and the rank of his littermates. The appeal of yarns about what dogs are thinking is undeniably and yieldingly a cottage industry in dog body language interpretation. Nothing appears to be more reinforcing to dog people than guessing about what dogs are thinking and hearing about other people's guesses. Label him dominant, mid-ranking, rank-seeking, 
lacking confidence, lacking good temperament, or whatever you like. The one I like, as you've seen, is labeling him uncomfortable. Or condition him to tolerate and enjoy having his collar yanked and his head restrained. Many training systems do both. This is fine, though less efficient than acknowledging that we really don't actually know exactly what he does. But we have a technique with a good track record at modifying it. Similarly, if the dog is a location guarder, it is a little late to agonize about some genetic predisposition or second-guess your breed choice. Your dog is growling at you. The most fruitful course of action is to condition the dog to enjoy being approached when he's dug in and to practice placement cues. And perhaps most tragically, a dog who is timid, growly, or reserved around strangers is not selective, loyal, or a good guard dog. He is experiencing innocuous things like visitors to your home as threatening. That's not a fun way to be. Even ideas that are on firmer ground than mind reading and labeling don't usually contribute much to the development of rehab technique. Knowledge of the fact that resource guarding or neophobia were adaptive in the past doesn't suggest effective modification strategies. You can't undo the evolutionary pressures that were on the ancestors of dogs or the selective breeding of the dog that came afterwards. You can't change his genes yet. There is one evolved model, however, that you can exploit to both prevent and resolve aggression problems, the capacity to learn, which is to change behavior based on experience. Once you recognize that exploiting learning laws is the most fruitful avenue for building treatment techniques, your only task regarding the goings on inside the dog's brain is to answer the following question when confronted with an aggressive dog. Is this dog upset? In other words, is this dog anxious, worried, afraid, or experiencing something unpleasant emotion or other? In the case of most aggressive dogs, the answer is yes, but there are some cases predation and bullying of other dogs, for instance, where the dog is not. If yet, if yes, it behooves the trainer to line up her Pavlovian conditioning ducks when designing the modification plan. Pavlovian Pavlovian conditioning has the power to actually alter the emotional response, which in turn will affect the behavior. If there is no emotional response driving the behavior, the trainer can and should blast away at operant conditioning, manipulating consequences to alter the, what the dog is doing. There is one way that aggression stemming from an underlying emotional response can be directly influenced by its consequences, and this is through the mechanism of negative reinforcement. If threatening and biting succeed... At increasing the distance between the dog and scary person, you can bet money that this strategy will be used again by the dog in the future. This is in fact a common way for a fearful dog to learn aggressive behaviors. Bite Threshold Model One model of aggression in domestic dogs that help organize eliciting stimuli, especially in those all too common cases where multiple stimuli combine to elicit a bite, is the Bite Threshold Model. All dogs have a threshold at which they will bite. The kind of breaking point also exists for you and me. There is a level of provocation at which you or I will blow and behave aggressively, probably by a way of an angry and abusive tirade of words. There is probably also the point at which you or I will get physical, even though we have been instructed otherwise all of our lives and are aware that it is against the law. There may be the odd person for whom nothing, including things like babies held at knife point or personal physical assault, wouldn't ever make them use physical force, but they are the extreme minority. There are definitely people who seem never to get angry and who often end up with problems like depression or psychosomatic illness instead. The point is that absolute pa passivity is not the yardstick we use to describe normal human behavior. There are no doubt dogs for whom no amount of abuse would constitute grounds for self-defense, but these are not normal animals. The Walt Disney ideal, however, would have us believe that absolute passivism is the norm for dogs with the exception of extreme provocation. Announcing that nice dogs don't fight and vicious dogs do is like saying that nice people never argue or get angry and vicious people do. Real dogs have a bite threshold. They also have thresholds for other levels of threat, such as growling, snarling, displaying their teeth, and snapping, biting the air. Dogs have triggers, which are stimuli that bug them. Typical triggers include categories of people to whom the dog is not socialized, hands and or being touched, approached, possession of food bowl or other guarded resources, and cues that predict aversives such as the choke collar or a strap used to beat the dog. 
Whether any one of these triggers by itself would elicit threat or biting depends on how intense, how close, how invasive, and how long duration a stimulus is it is and where the individual dog's particular thresholds lie. Triggers can be added together. Combinations of more than one trigger at the same time usually evoke a higher level of threat. This is the usual reason some people, some dogs seemingly bite without provocation or for no reason, possibly even without having ever behaved aggressively before. Some novel combination of elements pushes the dog higher than the element on their own, having ever pushed him previously. For any dog, a tentative profile can be built using an ex- the existing history. For instance, hypothetical dog Zaphod has always been uncomfortable around strange men. His other major risk factor is that he freezes up on approaches to his food bowl. The owner has also noticed that he seems just a little bit more sensitive at night than during the day and not perfectly re- relaxed with his hand with hands or when approached. These last two, by the way, are in the profiles to some extent of most dogs. One day Zaphod bites a man who approaches to pat him. The owner is completely floored as Zaphod has never bitten or even growled at anyone before and there was no provocation from the owner's perspective on this occasion. As can be seen from his profile, however, Zaphod has a time bomb which unfortunately went off. There is often a a suddenly and without warning quality to dogs whose growl, snap, and bite threshold are sandwiched close together like Zaphod's are. A stimulus that would evoke growling is almost at the bite threshold in these dogs. To say there were never any warning, however, is false. The warnings were always there in the form of his being uncomfortable about all those things. His owner simply bought into the nice dogs don't bite myth. Zaphod was probably also have bitten any strange man who went near him while he was eating. He is still, by the way, a nice dog. Another dog, Maggie, growls at children but has never ever made contact. She is uncomfortable about having her nails clipped and has numerous other predictable minor bugs in her profile. What is insidious in this case is that her owner is convinced that Maggie would never bite. After all, when a child approached her in her bed one day, she still only growled. As you can see from her profile, it wouldn't take much more to push her into inflicting an actual bite, but the owner was sure her dog would never bite, unless severally provoked. For Maggie, the item in her profile are provocation. Know that she probably would never be observed to snap as it would be too closely followed by a bite. It could very well be, by the way, that some individual dogs have one or the other of these threats omitted in his or her profile. Not all dogs have protracted warning before biting. Each dog has his own threat signature. The types of threat behavior, order of their appearance, and how low or high their respective thresholds are. To treat dogs who behave aggressively, all the risk factors must be teased out and worked on, a separate, worked on separately and safely. Each bar in the graph of Zaphlod and Maggie must be made as low as possible so that even if many are stacked up, they don't get up to the bite threshold. This means remedial socialization, resource guarding, approach and handling exercises, what the dog missed out on as a puppy has to be installed now. This is slow, painstaking work. The moral of the story is to prevent all this by actively intervening with young puppies before these problems develop. Prognosis. When dealing with adult biters, there are three options. You can treat the problem, manage the problem, or execute the dog. I say execute rather than euthanize because a a biting dog is not suffering and does not need or want a merciful death. He is killed because of transgressions he has committed against humans. That's what an execution is for. The tragic part is that the dog in most cases is behaving normally for a dog. Socialization and anti-aggression exercises were simply either omitted or insufficient and or the team team co-inspired to drop the ball. Management refers to physically preventing the problem if the dog is not socialized to kids. The dog is kept away from kids for the rest of his life. If the dog is a food bowl garter, the family stays away from the dog while, while he's eating. If the dog bites when his nails are clipped, he's muzzled and held down by two people whenever his nails are clipped. 
No attempt is made to get the dog over the problem. Sometimes management is the best option. Some dogs, especially those with a narrow enough problem, can live a full, normal life and be successfully kept away from their triggers by astute, caring owners. Treatment refers to efforts to change the dog's behavior. Using some combination of operant and Pavlovian conditioning, management for the duration of treatment is still necessary if one opts to treat. It compromises any desensitization programs to confront the dog with something he can't handle. The dog ends up with another rehearsal of his aggression, aggressive behavior rather than a therapeutic experience. If, for instance, the dog is afraid of men with beards but has been desensitized to the point where he will approach and take a food treat if the man is sitting still, it is counterproductive for some bearded man to walk up and try to pat the dog. The dog will eventually get to that stage with careful training but is not there yet. Better management would consist of the owner keeping bearded men from approaching until the dog is up to that point in the program. The softer the dog's mouth and the more compliant and committed the owner, the better the prognosis. Dogs with softer mouths do not have a routine, ruinous prospect of another offense looming over them should there be a management lapse, and a compliant, committed owner will have fewer instances of management failure, do the homework, and bounce back better from the occasional regression along the way.